This exhibit at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia shows us the changing face of the American soldier. The American Constitution changes too, as time marches on. Frequently those changes come after periods of tragedy and conflict, when the need for new rules is obvious. The Constitution was written in 1787 and ratified in 1788. But that Constitution, the Founders' Constitution, isn't the one we live under today. Our Constitution is very different. Now in part that's because of Supreme Court decisions and how judges should apply old constitutional provisions to modern circumstances is a big and difficult question. We talked about it a bit when we discussed originalism and the living constitution and we'll talk about it more in the context of specific cases. But in this module we're going to look at the way the words of the constitution change through amendments. Our history with amendments has not been one of slow and steady change. Instead, we get bursts of activity. We're going to look at three of those now. First, the adoption of the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. Next, the Reconstruction Amendments, which followed the Civil War. And last, the Progressive Era Amendments. The original Constitution, the one that goes out to the states for ratification, is missing something. It's missing what people maybe think about most when they think about the Constitution, individual rights. The original Constitution has some protections for individuals. The government can't enact ex post facto laws, or bills of attainder. But those are pretty technical and pretty limited. The lack of individual rights wasn't because people weren't concerned about them. They certainly were. The first lesson of American history, I've said, the lesson of the revolution, is that a central government can become a tyrant. And here the Constitution was creating a new and much more powerful central government. So they were certainly worried about this government violating individual rights. They tried to make that less likely by giving the national government limited and divided powers, but they were still worried. The Bill of Rights is a product of the American Revolution. Americans had fought a war arguing that their rights as Englishmen had been taken away. It is that the king had become a tyrant. And so the idea of rights was very much on their mind. The reason the Constitutional Convention didn't add a set of individual rights, a Bill of Rights, is a bit embarrassing, really. They didn't know what to put in. They were getting homesick, and they ran out of time. Here's a little more on that. You have to understand, every state had a Bill of Rights. Virtually every state had very carefully spelled out Bill of Rights. The guys wanted to go home. That's just the plain fact of it. And when someone said, should we have a Bill of Rights, everyone moaned because they thought by time we all argue over what should be in it and how many clauses will be here another month. But many people felt that a Bill of Rights would be desirable. When people were arguing about whether the states should ratify the Constitution, the people in favor of it were called Federalists, and those against it were called Anti-Federalists. On one side, the Federalists. They believed in strong national government that would empower over the states. The federal government is going to be able to protect us against the British and against other European powers, but they'll also protect us against the small-mindedness of state governments and make sure that the states don't uh, do unfair things to individuals. And they included some of the best-known leaders of the day, General George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. On the other side, the Anti-Federalists. They included Thomas Jefferson, George Mason, and Patrick Henry. They believed in strong local government, that the states should have most of the power. See, back then, people didn't fly places or have satellite TV. To them, their state was their country. One of the things the Anti-Federalists said was, we need a Bill of Rights. In response, the Federalists said in part that the federal government had only limited powers and couldn't invade individual rights. In part, they said that a Bill of Rights would be dangerous, because then the government might claim that people had no rights other than the ones listed. But in part, they sort of conceded the point. 
Five states, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, and Connecticut, ratify the Constitution pretty quickly and easily. But after that, it gets much harder. It's not clear which way Massachusetts will go, and ultimately Massachusetts ratifies with a recommendation that a Bill of Rights be added. Four of the next five ratifying states do the same thing. So when the Constitution does get ratified, New Hampshire is the ninth state in June 1788, one of the first things Congress does is draft a list of amendments and send them out to the states. There were actually 12 of these. Two didn't make it. The 10 that did are what we now call the Bill of Rights. What is remarkable about the Bill of Rights is that it, they are written in plain language. The most important thing to the framers was that this was a document for the people. There was a real push to have the people, the folks that live in this country, understand and be able to participate in their own democracy. The Bill of Rights came from the people. It wasn't something hatched in the mind of one person, James Madison or anyone else. It, it came from a national conversation. It's written in very crisp, compact language so that ordinary people could actually memorize it, the same way that people at the time memorized scripture passages or memorized a favorite song. It's supposed to get into your head. It's not written in legal ease precisely because it's a text from the people for the people, addressed to the people. What does the Bill of Rights do? Again, when we're thinking about the Constitution, it helps to ask three questions. What were the drafters worried about? How did they try to protect us? And how has their solution worked out in our world, hundreds of years later? The drafters are worried about the federal government. They're afraid it will become a tyrant, like King George did. And they tried to protect us in basically three ways. First, they gave the federal government only limited powers and divided those powers among the branches. Second, they gave individuals certain rights. That's one thing the Bill of Rights does. Constitutional rights protect certain activities against interference from certain actors, usually the government. Some rights, like the Bill of Rights, protect against the federal government, and some rights are rights against states. And third, something we think of less, they protected state power, also through the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The lesson of the revolution, remember, isn't that people can go to court to assert their rights against a tyrant. It's that the states will protect them. So an important thing to remember about the Bill of Rights is that it applies only to the federal government. It places restrictions on the federal government, not the states. The drafters are not worried about what the states will do to their own citizens. In their minds, states are the good guys. But there's still one puzzle to note. Most of the cases we think of as Bill of Rights cases, First Amendment cases, Fourth Amendment, Eighth Amendment, the cases we'll talk about, really aren't relying on those amendments. The Bill of Rights, remember, applies only against the federal government. And the cases we'll talk about are usually cases against states. So the framers thought we'd have states standing up against the federal government. But instead, we're seeing individuals standing up against states. Why is that? How did it happen? Tune in next time.